Good morning. So I want to talk about smart cities. And uh, when I tell people I have an interest in smart cities, they imagine something like this and ask me, when will we be there? You know, is it going to look like that in a couple of years? Um, and also, when you say smart cities, does that imply our cities are now dumb cities? Um, and you know, every time you go over a pothole, you wonder about that. Um, at least, maybe we don't want to end up there. This is actually the year and the month that in Blade Runner in 1982, they envisioned Los Angeles would look like that. So uh, perhaps we're you know, not quite there. But um, the way I like to think about smart cities is uh, really it's not so much the destination, but the journey. Uh, it's a process by which our urban environments are going to get better and improve over time. And maybe it's not so much about being a smart city, but perhaps being a smarter city all along, right, in every, every step of that way. And perhaps we'd like our cities to look more like places that are not cities. So um, you may or may not believe it, uh, depending on your experience this last week. If you had uh, taken an uh, airplane flight that came into LAX uh, yesterday, like I did, it may seem like LA is still uh, quite polluted. There's a lot of uh, smog and, and bad air quality. But um, in fact, research uh, from some of my colleagues at the University of Southern California shows that we've made dramatic improvements to the quality of uh, air here. Um, they tested um, the lungs of kids and showed really significant improvement in, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, the health of these lungs uh, over the past really two or more decades. And uh, the kids today in LA have fewer breathing problems than they did in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so there has actually been a, a demonstrable improvement. And this has happened because of regulations. It's happened because we have um, various mechanisms to detect the, the emissions and um, uh, to actually monitor the quality of our air and take action based on what, what we can uh, sense. Similarly, uh, Los Angeles has uh, taken the lead in uh, being a data-driven city when it comes to making uh, the city cleaner. Uh, there's been an effort to create uh, indices of how clean our streets are, and it's kind of a data-driven approach where we're trying to identify where the problems are that, that uh, can be addressed in a systematic manner once you collect uh, data about what's happening. Uh, definitely in the uh, transportation domain, there are ways in which our cities can get smarter, and certainly living in Los Angeles, we would all like our traffic to be a lot easier, uh, you know, particularly during the peak hours, and solutions like congestion pricing are being investigated, um, and if, if they were to be deployed at large scale, not just on highways, but really in our downtown areas, uh, at some scale, we would see the benefits of that happening. And so all of these different you know, efforts that are underway, have been underway really for quite some time, rely at their core on data. So uh, we've been talking about um, you know, the internet and, and the benefits we've gotten from the internet in terms of being able to communicate, collect, process uh, large amounts of data. We're starting to now think about all the ways in which this data is useful to make our, our cities smarter, but there's still uh, some challenges, and technology has, of course, a role to play. In my own research, um, I've been looking at what I call the ABC of data technologies, uh, AI and machine learning, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies, and connected devices, which is sort of perhaps a, a broader name for things like IoT and even connected vehicles and other um, contexts in which the connectivity helps. And they're all really central uh, to uh, data because uh, they have to do with how do you collect data, how do you secure it, how do you share it in a trusted manner, um, how do you value it, how do you pay for that uh, data, how do you process uh, this data, derive insights, and take uh, action, and, and really automate all of these uh, pieces and, and make it efficient and scalable. So as we pursue our research, um, we find ourselves asking many fundamental questions about data. And uh, a lot of them have to do with the question of ownership of data, uh, data rights management. Um, you know, what rights do these data owners have? Do they have the ability to set a price uh, for that data? And can they actually be uh, paid for the data that they provide to others? And what, what would be technological solutions that can help address uh, these questions? So um, we heard actually already in uh, our earlier talks um, by Alex, for example, that the internet originally wasn't really designed uh, very well with respect to valuing data. 
And until the Satoshi paper, really, there wasn't a decentralized mechanism to make payments over the internet. And not only that, the internet itself, the way it's architected, the protocols don't have any notion of value. There really isn't a way to say, I want to pay to move this data from A to B. I want to be paid for moving my data from A to B. So there are consequences of that failure of the internet design. We see email spam, DDoS attacks, and many other security problems because it's actually very cheap to send massive amounts of data on the internet. That data could be spam, it could be data that's actually targeting a server and helping to bring it down. We see other consequences of the failure of internet protocols from the outset to value data, which is that you now have to add it on top through these third-party mediated credit card um, systems and so on. And because the protocols don't understand you know, data and its value, um, you end up having to, and the cost associated with these transactions is quite high, you have to kind of try and lock in users for a long time into an account and there's only so many newspapers you can subscribe to before yet another newspaper whose articles you want to read is asking you to become a member on their website, and that starts to be challenging. So essentially, it creates a lot of friction for uh, providing content over the internet. And I think fundamentally, because protocols on the internet have never handled data, we've also seen companies have to resort to other models for uh, making money on the internet and the target advertising revenue model uh, where collecting large amounts of data about you, selling that to advertisers or third parties, uh, potentially causing really abuse of the trust with which you, you provided that data in exchange for free um, services. And, and this is something that's really a natural consequence of the fact that it's very hard to make money off of content on the internet. And so people look for these other approaches to do that, and, and we have run into issues with that in the, the past several years. So people have been thinking about it at many layers, and uh, for example, recently our governor in California started uh, to talk about a data dividend, this notion that perhaps you, know, you could legally require Facebook and Google to, to ask users um, to, you know, or, or ask big companies to, to provide to users payment for the data that they're collecting from them, right? Uh, it's not clear how all of this would really work, and it sounds a little bit to me like too little too late, uh, you know, coming back after the fact and saying we'll be able to figure out something that will allow us to quantify the value of this data and, and, and force big companies to pay the users. I'm quite skeptical that something um, of that scale is possible unless we build in new technologies that make it easy to uh, monetize uh, data from the ground up. So in the original paper uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto, um, he, she, they that uh, wrote this, uh, this paper actually made a very uh, specific point about transaction costs. The fact that today the transaction cost for moving data on, on and just doing anything at all is so expensive that it limits the minimum practical transaction size, which in turn cuts off the possibility for small casual transactions. And that's really been the problem on the internet. Because if I want to get a few bytes of data, it's not going to be worth a lot, right? And so being able to charge for that small amounts of data from many different sources on a casual, ongoing basis, that's a hard problem. And it's something that the internet to date is not designed and cannot handle. So when we look at blockchain technology for solutions to this problem, um, one sort of starting point for me as an academic researcher is not to think of blockchain or distributed ledger technologies as one monolithic solution, but really a collection of building blocks, if you will, if I may uh, use the word blocks there. Um, in thinking about all of these building blocks, what are the different capabilities they provide? Think mindfully about the problems that we have and then figure out how to build solutions that uh, connect these building blocks together. So do we want to leverage the capability of uh, DLTs to enable micropayments? Do we want to use them to design smart contracts that allow certain transactions to uh, be done with low friction? Uh, do we want the capabilities that have to do with uh, providing more privacy or anonymity for transactions and so on, and really think about uh, what, what the problem is and how we would um, organize a solution that, that uh, uses these components? So let's look, at, let's look at the internet today. 
The way it operates at the application layer is that uh, a predominant communication pattern on the internet is what we call client-server communications. So you've got clients like your browser on your, on your phone, um, and the way it's getting content from some server remotely is it's issuing GET requests, and that server responds with the content that you asked for. Okay, it's a very simple abstraction. You ask for something, you get it. This application layer protocol, HTTP, which is the, the protocol we use for web browsing, um, doesn't have any notion that what you ask for has some value, and it has no way for you to actually pay for what you got directly at that layer. So that protocol itself has no semantics associated with, with this being a value-based transaction. So our researchers at USC um, have been trying to think about how would we reconstitute rethink, reimagine protocols at the application layer of the internet. And here's one example. It's a protocol we call SDPP, stands for Streaming Data Payment Protocol. It creates a whole um, package around the entire transaction of a client asking a server, well, give me a menu of content that you have. And just like in a restaurant menu, it's like, what can I get and what is it worth? Have the seller provide that data over a traditional TCP, potentially with TLS added uh, channel. Uh, be able to invoice for the data provided by the server. Have the client not only acknowledge the data that's received, but also make payments uh, for that data. And um, get receipts uh, as in, in return of the payments that they make. And all of these sort of transactions get logged in a records medium. The micropayments can go through a cryptocurrency channel. The actual data flows through a traditional uh, transport layer security plus TCP channel. And so this is a way that we're baking in the notion of paying for data within the application layer protocol. And what this means is that a browser that is SDPP enabled would automatically be able to talk to a server about what kind of content it's getting and what is the value of that content and actually make payments for it. Which means that above that, your website individually doesn't have to lock you into a particular account, doesn't require you to sign up in advance in order to be able to, uh, you know, be able to get this valuable data from, from that site. So it enables this other micropayment-based um, model for providing content over the internet. Let's take something as simple as buying a digital good. Say you want to go buy a file from someone remotely that you don't know. Okay? Think about what could happen. They could say, go ahead and send me the money. You know, use bitcoins if you like. Uh, and then I'll send you this PDF file. So you go ahead and you transfer the bitcoins to their account, and they disappear because you didn't actually know who they were and really you didn't have a prior relationship with them. Well, the next time someone says this to you, you say, no, no, I know better. You send me the file first, and then I'll transfer my coins to you. Uh, and they go ahead and do that. And of course, now you've learned you can also walk away, and you do. So this is actually a very fundamental problem. It's called the buyer and seller's dilemma. The problem is that somehow these two-way exchange of payment and the delivery of the digital good, they're not happening in synchrony. They're happening as two separate steps. It's not what's called an atomic transaction. So in uh, some of our research, um, we've developed a double deposit smart uh, contract. And it's an escrow where both the buyer and seller first deposit some funds. They go ahead with their uh, exchange of uh, payment for the digital good. And when everything is good, uh, you're able to certify to the smart contract that the exchange has happened from both parties, and it returns the deposits and transfers the payment. Um, now, this is for digital goods. We can actually prove mathematically that the Nash equilibrium uh, for the buyer and seller in this contract is to behave honestly with respect to each other so long as the deposits are sufficiently high. And this is for a digital good, but you can also uh, apply this to physical goods if what was provided with the physical good was a, let's say, it's deposited in a lockbox that you use a digital key to open. And so the exact uh, same smart contract could be used for that uh, purpose. Um, in other research, we're looking at ways that you can actually add the protocol layer at layer three, if you will, the network layer of um, the internet, start enabling payments for bandwidth reservation, um, where you're able to essentially say, I want to reserve a certain amount of bandwidth for a certain amount of time between two particular locations, and your network provider is able to just provide you that capability on the fly without requiring, let's say, a long-term commitment to using uh, the resources of the network. And that can enable new network uh, business models as well. 
Uh, we've extended these ideas from client-server uh, types of systems to uh, what are called publish-subscribe um, patterns. We've uh, explored how these ideas can be brought to the automotive uh, space to allow payments for content, for services, uh, for computing that might be exchanged between vehicles, particularly as we go to more autonomous settings. There may be value for cars to exchange the sensor data or processing of sensor data from other cars around them or exchange information about availability of um, electric recharging stations and, and so on. And so again, trying to build this notion of payments and also other components like trust and ratings into, uh, into the protocol layer of the connectivity. So I started by talking about smart cities. Let me return back to that theme and talk about how marketplaces and data marketplaces in particular have a role to play for smart cities. Uh, it's an effort we have uh, in collaboration with the city of Los Angeles and a number of commercial as well as academic partners uh, that we call I3, Intelligent IoT Integrator. Um, and kind of the, the thesis here is that cities have actually always been um, thriving places for the buying and selling of goods and services. There are marketplaces, this one is right down the street, uh, where we go and uh, buy what we're interested in from people that uh, have something valuable to provide. And taking this idea to data, um, we need to add one more component, which is that the owners of data can come to this marketplace and provide their data uh, under a lot of um, control about who can access their data, when, at what price, at, under what condition, and even if they need to, uh, to be able to revoke that access. So putting these ideas together, uh, we're building a platform called i3, which allows and decouples, really, uh, data providers from data consumers for applications. The idea being that many applications could benefit from the same streams of data, the same, and different streams of data can be made more easily available to a given application, and to do this in a way that um, kind of breaks traditional silos where the entire application is uh, developed and built by a single organization. So the i3 platform allows the data providers to describe their data products, set conditions on them, charge for that data, allows the application developers to have a one-stop shop to come and say, these are the types of data streams I need to build my application. It also allows for data brokers that can come to this marketplace and buy raw data and sell back refined data. Going back to our marketplace, you can definitely go to a market and buy raw vegetables, but you can also go to a restaurant next door that has taken that um, set of ingredients, has added value to it, and is now selling it as a value-added meal for you. Well, in the same way, data analytics applied to raw data streams might create more value for the end user, and this can be sold back on the marketplace. Uh, earlier this year, the city of Los Angeles, working with us, demonstrated how um, they could build a parking application for uh, the LA area over such a marketplace. Uh, to give you an idea, you know, the county of LA has something like 88 cities. The city of LA has a number of parking um, meters that are sensorized, but there are also dozens and dozens of private garage owners with their own source of data. You've got streets where there is no metered parking, but there may be cameras that were deployed originally for some other application that could be analyzed to infer when parking spots are made available. And taking all these disparate sources of data sitting under different administrative domains, bringing them to one location has a huge value for the application developer. Today, if you wanted to build a parking application that applied to all of LA individually as a company, if you were a startup trying to build this application, you would have to enter into data agreements with hundreds of different entities. And so to have one platform where all of that could be managed and uh, curated and made available for you would be a big advantage uh, for, for such an application. So this is a use case of what such a marketplace might enable, but you can imagine many other cases where the scale um, that such a platform uh, can enable would be really useful. Uh, in the other direction, you may have deployed a video camera originally for one application, perhaps to do with security, uh, or to monitor traffic in an intersection, but the same camera might be useful to detect potholes or to identify available parking spaces. And different application developers might find value for your data that you hadn't even thought of in, in the first place when you deployed your, your sensor devices. And so this marketplace enables monetization of your data in, in, um, in many ways as the, as the provider of data on the marketplace. Um, so the I3 Consortium is a public-private partnership uh, currently uh, led and hosted at USC with many, many partners, as I mentioned, in uh, government, in research labs, in universities around the world, as well as companies big and small. 
Um, and the work of this consortium is focused on uh, building an open source uh, software, which we're releasing at the end of this year, uh, and that we're continuing to work on. Um, currently, that i3 platform is intended to be a node that runs at the level of a community or city. It could be a downtown area, an airport, a university campus. And um, we're envisioning in our roadmap that you can have many such nodes start to connect uh, with each other to grow over time. Uh, but as we do that, we're also doing research to see how could we decentralize that platform uh, itself, even for a single community. And uh, this, this leads us to sort of questions of, you know, what is it that you might benefit from if you were to decentralize a data marketplace? Uh, the biggest benefit is that you no longer need this trusted third party that would be operating the market to be unbiased. You can trust that there's no manipulation of recommendations or ratings. Today, if you go buy something on eBay or Amazon and you recommended a product, do you really know if it was recommended in your interest or in the interest of the platform um, uh, owner? And uh, essentially, eliminating this monopoly power of a market platform owner could have a lot of benefits in increasing trust and transparency with respect to the operation of such a data marketplace. Um, and of course, uh, the actual exchange of data for value is another uh, component that uh, you would like the decentralized data marketplace to enable. So we've uh, described uh, in a work uh, earlier last year and have continued to work on a decentralized data marketplace for smart cities, um, DDM for short. And it takes many of these components uh, that, in fact, uh, was mentioned uh, by Alex um, in the context of Uber, uh, that there are sort of many components you would expect to see in a marketplace, uh, such as uh, identity and uh, reputation management, recommendations, uh, query and search, uh, data transfer and, and payments, and decentralizing each of these components would allow us to architect a decentralized data marketplace. So this is uh, one of the efforts that we're currently engaged in. Um, to really sum up, I think the future for smart cities is bright so long as we keep uh, iterating and improving and moving in directions that are um, you know, not only an improvement over what we have, but moves us towards healthier, more livable, greener uh, environments. And technology has a role to play. And I think one of the ways in which uh, we're going to see that role play out is by kind of unlocking the value of data, making it more frictionless to be able to pay for the types of data that let us know that we're doing the right thing and, uh, and build these large-scale applications that will power our uh, cities in the future. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you.